We live in inflammation nation, fanning the flames of poor health and disease with our food. But fear not, pack your passports because we are leaving there and flying over to a healthy country and learning about the top anti-inflammatory foods. Welcome to the Exam Room Live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for watching and downloading in more than 150 countries around the world and making the Exam Room one of the most consumed consumed nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. So what are these magical anti-inflammatory foods that can douse the flames of chronic disease? Well, we're going to find out with two familiar faces and friends of the exam room who are now teaming up together for an extraordinary new game-changing project together. First, Dr. Jim Loomis, former team physician for the St. Louis Rams before they headed out to LA in the NFL, also the St. Louis Cardinals in Major League Baseball. He also happened to revitalize his own health and now is looking at reshaping what patient care looks like, putting a premium on nutrition. Also, Karen Dugan, STL Veg Girl, a cancer survivor, now founder of the Center for Plant Based Living in St. Louis. Phenomenal people, friends of mine, friends of the show, and they are here today to raise our health IQs. And if there's a question that you have about anti inflammatory foods or whatever else is on your mind, go ahead, post it in the comment or in the chat, and we will get to as many as we can here on the program today. With that, we welcome the doc, the chef, Karen Dugan, Dr. Jim Loomis, back to the exam room live. So good to see you both. Always a pleasure. Thanks for Chuck. having us on, Chuck. Yeah, it's great. Doc, let's start with you, my friend. Inflammation, before we get to the anti-inflammatory foods, let's talk about what the difference is between acute inflammation and chronic inflammation. Yeah, that, that's a great point, Chuck. So, you know, um, we need to be able to create inflammation. You know, if you, if you cut yourself or you get an infection, uh, our bodies have the ability to mount an immune response, an inflammatory response to help us heal that wound or fight off that infection. And that's, that's obviously uh, crucial for human survival. The, the problem is it, it's not the acute inflammation that typically gets us in trouble. It's the chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation has been associated with a wide variety of diseases, you know, diabetes, heart disease, uh, cancers. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, um, we, we live in this kind of totally inflammatory, especially food world, right? So um, um, there, there are many foods that help us fight inflammation. And there's also many chronic diseases like obesity, which can contribute to the inflammation. So it's kind of a double whammy. We lead a lifestyle that promotes chronic inflammation. That lifestyle gives us chronic diseases or conditions like obesity, which further that, you know, as you mentioned earlier, it's kind of like we have this low grade fire burning with the chronic inflammation. And then we just throw gas on it every day. So when you're talking about a disease like obesity, which is something that millions and millions and millions of people, I mean, like what is more than three quarters of the population is overweight, 40 four and change percent now uh, have obesity. Right. You're talking about fanning the flames. Would I be correct in assuming that the greater a person's obesity problem is, the hotter the temperature of their inflammation, so to speak? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Obesity in and of itself creates chronic inflammation because, um, you know, obesity, when we when we kind of overfill our, our adipose tissue, our fat cells, that creates inflammation within those cells, which leaks out, if you will, in, in, into our body. So it, obesity in and of itself is an inflammatory condition. And, 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 and the, but the big, you know, again, the vicious cycle is it's a lot of the foods that we eat um, are also inflammatory, which also cause obesity, right? So, so, so it really is a vicious cycle we, we live in today. All right, let's get to some of the more anti-inflammatory foods. The thing that I like about the Doc and Chef project is that Doc, you've got, you know, the prescription, but then Karen fills this prescription in the kitchen and really makes this the most delicious medicine. <laughs> of all time. So what I want to do with you guys today is talk about some of the top anti-inflammatory foods. So instead of really keep putting logs on that fire, let's talk about eating some things that will help taper out those flames. Uh, Dr. Loomis, give us your list of some of the top anti-inflammatory foods. And then Karen, we're going to come right to you and we're going to talk about how we can make them delicious. So, so Chuck, there's kind of two broad categories of anti-inflammatory foods. There's foods that are high in omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids 
help our bodies create the compounds that are anti-inflammatory as opposed to the omega-6 fatty acids, which are inflammatory. Omega-6s come from things like meat and dairy and, and, and edible oils and things like that. Omega-3s are things like chia seed and hemp seed and pumpkin seed and green leafy vegetables, um, uh, you know, things like that. So, so diets that are high in omega-3 fatty acids are, are anti-inflammatory. And probably more important than that are, are foods that are high in antioxidants. Antioxidants uh, help us, you know, one of the things that cause inflammation is what's called oxidative stress. Um, when we, bur we burn oxygen for fuel and, and, and to help us fuel our bodies and when we get excess oxidative stress, it creates inflammation. Our bodies have a very limited ability to mitigate oxidative stress. And we, the only way we can augment that is through food. And in general, the more highly colored a food is, the more antioxidant or anti-inflammatory it is. So, so you know, that, this idea of eating the rainbow. Um, most people don't realize that things like dark beans are probably some of the most highly anti-inflammatory uh, foods out there, uh, even more than, the, than things like berries, like raspberries and blueberries and strawberries, which we traditionally show, associate with as being anti-inflammatory. And it's the pigments in the skin. There's also a wide variety of herbs and spices that have profound anti-inflammatory effects, things like turmeric, uh, the active ingredient being curcumin, um, which is highly anti-inflammatory, but also things like garlic and cinnamon and ginger. Um, so, so, so there are some specific herbs and spices that I love to incorporate in my own diet and, and recommend to patients who are suffering with some of these chronic inflammatory conditions. All right, Karen. So now you've kind of got that wonderful shopping list of the <laughs> prescription for the kitchen. Um, when you hear about some of the foods Dr. Loomis was just talking about, do you get excited? Are you like, man, I could really work with this and make this like something that is just going to knock your socks off. And oh, by the way, act like a fire hose in there, putting out the f uh, flames that fan this disease. Okay. So when we first started talking about doing this podcast and we were talking about different topics and we landed on inflammation because it is everywhere. I was like, yes, this is a challenge. So I, it, like seriously last night put together this smoothie i'm not a big smoothie person but i do know there's plenty of people out there who really just like to get a lot of things in in the morning just by drinking it so i completely understand that but we also have seen that there's there can be a lot of hidden calories and fat in smoothies so i wanted to pack this thing full of anti-inflammatory foods, but not have it be so heavily concentrated in calories. Here's what I have. So I have uh, pomegranate seeds, dark. I have organic blueberries, dark. I have frozen cherries, dark. I have, come on, seriously, chocolate, uh-huh, dark. <laughs> And of course I have, yes, I have two greens. I have organic, <clears throat> pardon me, organic spinach. And then I have this, I'm such a lover of broccoli, not sprouts. I can't really do the sprouts, but microgreens. So I actually put some microgreens in there as well. And not to forget what Dr. Loomis just said, turmeric, but it is soaked up by the body by putting in a little bit of black pepper. Don't be grossed out. This thing is delicious. I whipped it up. And oh my gosh, it just looks like and tastes like, not even kidding you, a chocolate milkshake. This thing is amazing. It will be on the website later on. Oh my gosh. So let's just, I'm not even going to finish there, okay? So you're going to start your day with a chocolate shake. And then last night, I created a, not cheese whiz, but a cheesy whiz. This stuff, now... Hella out to all my Gen Xers. This is like the cheese whiz that we used to eat straight out of the jar. Not even kidding you. This is up on the website now. And I am going to dip in my cauliflower, steamed cauliflower and broccoli. So if you want to uninflame, chocolate and cheese is the way to go. All right. Now let's, let's number one, talk about this because I would be remiss if I didn't point out that about half of that chocolate shake looked to be mi missing from the bottle already. I think that you may have had a healthy taste test. Can you confirm one way or the other, please? Affirmative, sir. Yeah, there it is. There it is. It is breakfast time there. And, and number two, like on a more serious tip, um, I remember 
um, going over to my grandparents' house growing up. And my grandfather, man, he loved cheese whiz in a can. And I mean, he would take a cracker and he would somehow fill that. It must have been like a four inch high pile of cheese whiz on every cracker that he somehow managed to fit in his mouth. And I'm wondering, like, Dr. Loomis, what would the internal response be based off of granddaddy's four inches of canned cheese whiz versus the cheesy whiz that Karen just whipped up at the Center for Plant-Based Living? Well, che cheese is is one of the more highly inflammatory foods we can eat, right? So it's the, it, in fact, dairy and cheese are the number one uh, source of things of, of saturated fat and saturated fat in and of itself is high in omega-6s. So, so cheese is a highly inflammatory um, food. And not only that, you know, it can raise our, raise our LDL cholesterol and, and, you know, it's packed with calories. You know, every gram of fat that we consume has nine calories versus four calories for carbohydrate or protein. And so, so again, you know, it, it's a vicious cycle because when we eat these, these fat laden foods that are also high in saturated fats, highly inflammatory, high in calories. And, and so, you know, your, your fat cells don't like it. Your arteries don't like it. Your you know, on and on and on. Your brain cells don't like it. And so, so now you compare that to a cheesy whiz that's, uh, Karen hasn't shared all the ingredients, but, but I would imagine that, that, that yellowness is probably a little more turmeric that's commonly used to, to make um, these kind of foods, you know, yellow look cheesy. So again, you know, it, it, it as opposed to being anti-inflammatory, it's, I mean, it's supposed to being highly inflammatory, you can make something that tastes just as good, if not better, that is good for you, right? So it's anti-inflammatory. Um, and, and, and it's pretty amazing, actually, that we can take these plants and turn them in to healthy food, you know, these healthy bathing our bodies in, in anti-inflammatory compounds. Yeah, and Karen, let's uh, run down the ingredients on the cheesy whiz right there. Is uh, the doc straight on when he says it's probably turmeric that's giving it that yellow tint? It is. And there's also um, butternut squash in there. So you're getting some vegetables in there, garlic powder, onion powder, a little bit of um, yellow miso, so good for the gut. Um, and I don't have all the ingredients with me now, but it is already up online. And so let me ask you this. When people come into your shop there um, and and when we've been filming episodes, I've seen them. people literally just walk in off the street and they want to talk to you about what is happening in the Center for Plant Based Living. Honest to God. And a lot of them are people who have never eaten uh, or at least think that they have never eaten anything vegan a day in their life. And yet when you give them the opportunity through your courses to sample some of the foods that you're eating today, what is the typical response that you see when somebody would say, eat the cheesy whiz versus, you know, like my granddaddy, the whole can of cheese whiz on the cracker? <laughs> One of my favorite things that happens here when we, we have a, an in shop class once a month and it's a cooking class. I do a demo. Everybody gets recipes. I taste all the food. Um, and I love it so much, especially when there's people here who have not been here before, um, their eyes light up and they, and they say, oh my God, I actually like this or, or this is even better. Oh my gosh, this actually tastes good. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, so it, it better tastes good or else I probably wouldn't be in business. Right. So, um, yeah, that's, it's just, it's so fun. And people, when people, as you've seen, Chuck, they come through the door and they, they kind of look around like what is this place what's happening you know and and we talk about what, what goes on here with the classes and the programs and and all kinds of different things that we do and and they look at me and they say well but i'm not vegan i'm not plant-based i'm not really sure and i said well you don't have to be sure you just have to maybe want to think about adding more plants to your plate that's it you don't have to be fill in the blank you just have to be kind of curious about how you can be a little bit healthier that's it. I, I think just open your mind and be ready to take that step. And it was funny. I was uh, this week doing a, a show up in Providence, Rhode Island with the vegan comedian, Mike Kaplan. And, you know, we were kind of talking about the same thing about, well, how do you get somebody to kind of become more comfortable with the idea of eating a plant based diet? And he's like, one of the things that I hear a lot is, yeah, but I'm, I'm more of a more meat and potatoes type of guy. And he's like, well, cool. You're already halfway there. You just cut out the yeah. meat and boom, <laughs> potatoes are vegan. That's good. And yeah. he's like, he puts it in a really funny way, but also it makes a ton of sense, right? And and so like, 
when you break down the walls like that, I think that it it really, really, really helps. Um, before we go on to the next question, we have a lot of people right now wondering about the website. So there, look, look at behind the scenes. Let me just tell y'all, uh, they don't like it when I drop their name, but Ali is amazing. So this show does not happen without Ali's help. So Ali, thank you for getting the cheesy whiz recipe up right there. STLVegGirl.com. You see it there on the screen. We're also going to drop a link for you in the show description and in the episode notes. So stay tuned for that. But I promise you, this is definitely worth the time in the kitchen. By the way, Karen, how long did the cheesy whiz recipe take to put together? Um, I guess probably about 20 minutes last night. That's not too bad no, at all. It. And that that's no, but that was creating that. that was creating it. You could really put it together in probably three minutes. If you had all your ingredients out in front of you, throw everything in the blender, let it whirl up, done. So I created it in 20. You can put it together in three. And Dr. Loomis, kind of back to you. We were talking about the difference in response between the cheese whiz versus the, the cheesy whiz. Would the same thing be said for, say, a milkshake that you would get at a fast food restaurant or a diner versus the yummy thing that Karen has already crushed half of? Exactly. So, so you know, again, so, you know, what's the basis of, of a milkshake? Well, it's ice cream. You know, it's loaded with fat. It's also loaded with sugar. And, and, you know, we know that the sugar from fruit is handled differently by our bodies than, the, than just eating kind of straight up sugar. So it's the exact same thing. And as, as, as Karen pointed out, you know, the cocoa powder that she put in there, the raw co cacao powder is, is highly anti-inflammatory. And, you know, you were mentioning earlier about people come in, they're scared, you know, oh, I'm not plant based. I'm not vegan. You know, I don't know what to do. And, and I think the beauty of what Karen does and I, and I think that kind of the. The, the way to bring people to the to the other side, if you will, bring them over to, a, to this healthier lifestyle is just serve them good food. Right. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, so, so I, I found when I introduced foods to my to my friends and family, um, it, when I serve them a tasty meal, then they're going to eat it and they're going to enjoy it. And, and it doesn't matter if it's got meat or not meat. And sometimes they're amazed when I serve a you know, a jackfruit pulled pork taco that there's not meat in it. Right. <laughs> or, um, you know, you make a, a, a parts of palm crab cake and they're amazed that there's no, no actually crab in it. And so, so, you know, I, I think the way to make this really accessible is just to make good food. And that's what Karen is, is such a genius at is, is taking foods like cheese whiz and using these incredibly healthy foods like butternut squash and the onion and the garlic, you know, and the turmeric to make something that tastes just as good, if not better, and is exponentially better for you. I'm telling you, she is a whiz in the kitchen. You guys just wait to see some of the recipes that they come up with on the Doc and Chef. I'm telling, wait till you, I mean, guys, just you wait. Just, just you wait. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, I want to take a question really quickly from Aaron at 1014. Going back kind of to what it was that you were just saying there, Dr. Loomis, about the chocolate in particular. But Aaron, uh, Aaron is like, but wait a minute. Chocolate, though, has a lot of saturated fat. You've said that saturated fat is inflammatory. So how does one wrap their head around that? How do you figure this one out? Well, what Karen used was 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 just the cocoa powder, right? So there's really very little fat in that. Um, chocolate can have a lot of fat. The problem is most people, when they think about chocolate, it's milk chocolate, right? And and which has a ton of fat and calories. Now there is there is some fat in 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 you know dark chocolate, for example. But you know what you're looking for is is one that has much more of it's much more concentrated in the cacao is and, and less fat. You know, fat is OK um, when it comes from a relatively whole food, plant based source of, of food. You know, avocados have a little saturated fat. Um, there's a little bit of saturated fat in, in nuts. Um, so and those are but those are whole foods. And so as long as you're being a little bit careful and limiting your overall fat intake, you know, a little bit of saturated fat is not going to hurt anything. And, and most experts recommend we probably shouldn't exceed about 10 to 15 grams of saturated fat per day. And, in, in our diets. I want to say hi really quickly to January. Jasmine says this is their first time being able to watch live. That's so cool. Uh, says that uh, her husband is a full-time vegan and she's trying to be. She says listening here helps my food choices every day. So thank you all. Well, awesome. Thank you, January Jasmine. Appreciate you hanging out. Good luck getting over that 100%. It's, it's not 
trust me, is a guy that used to eat 10,000 calories of evil every single day. And I mean evil in every sense of the word. I mean, it's really not as difficult as you think to take that that full step forward. I promise you it's going to be okay. Just, you know, pinch your nose and jump in the deep end. You're going to be good to go. Um, question from Quarantine Quartet. We talked about beans a little bit at the top of the show. Uh, Doc, I'll start with you. And then Karen, be thinking about some of the things that you like to do with beans in the kitchen. Quarantine Quartet got in early at 930, says, I've been eating a lot of beans as they're anti-inflammatory, but should I be worried about too many oxalates at the same time? Yeah, that's a great question. That, so, so th there's, there's some, so there's several, so oxalates, um, uh, can in some people, not everybody, but excess oxalates can lead to kidney stones. That's the big problem. Uh, the other concern some people have with beans is they also contain a compound called phytates, which some people feel are an anti-nutrient. They, they block the absorption of other foods, but here's the deal. Uh, when we cook beans, um, the, the oxalate, the phytate um, uh, levels drop down significantly. In fact, to the point where they're really not clinically significant. So as long as you know, as long as you're not eating those dark, those the dried beans raw, which I'm, you know, you need to have a dentist on call if you tried to do that. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you know, you don't really need to worry about it. For people that have a history of kidney stones, you do need to be a little bit careful of oxalates. Uh, foods that have a lot more oxalates than beans are things like spinach and Swiss chard and things like that. But again, when we cook or when we cook spinach or chard, it decreases the oxalate uh, concentration significantly by about 60, 80 percent. So I think that I mean, those foods are OK. Where I've seen people get in trouble is putting a pound of raw spinach in a smoothie in the morning. Um, and, and, and I have seen some people have issues, especially if they have a history of, of oxalate kidney stones. Yeah, I believe that there was a, a famous celebrity couple uh, who talked about maybe getting in a little bit of trouble from eating too much greens there. I um, mean, it actually scared them off. So um, I guess that goes back to the old adage of too much of a good thing is That's still right. too much. Right. Um, all right. So now, Karen, we've got the prescription for beans. Let's go ahead and fill that in your kitchen. If somebody comes in there and says, hey, Doc says I got to eat some beans. What are you cooking up for them? Well, if they're new to adding more plants to their plate. I would say first, probably don't start with the chickpea because it's very dense and it, it you have to work, your, butt, your gut has to work a little bit harder to break that down. So I would say start with a lentil because that has a very thin skin and it's very soft. You could also start with a black bean and even um, a cannellini bean, which is an Italian white bean. You can find that at any grocery store. Start with those beans because they have very thin skins and they're very soft on the inside. Now, if you really do love chickpeas, it's my favorite bean. Um, start with a hummus. So you're doing kind of that pre-digestion for your body as well. So you can do a hummus. Um, you can even make black bean burgers or and you could throw some chickpeas in there. Again, you're grinding those up with your hands or a food processor. So you're pre-digesting those beans. So it's not quite as hard on your tummy. Yeah, we've got uh, quite a few beaners uh, among the exam roomies today. Quarantine Quartet says that they're actually making a bean stew while watching us this morning. Um, Michael is actually eating a bean casserole, so he's good to go there. Oh. Everybody's loading up on their beans. By the way, if you guys have a question for the Doc and Chef, post it in the comments or in the chat. We're going to get to as many as we can here as long as we've got the mailbag open. I uh, want to take a question here from Kim, Dr. Loomis. And this is a pretty good one, I think. Uh, wondering about omega-3 fatty acids. She says, uh, fatty fish is on a lot of best lists for fighting inflammation, but do plant-based omega-3s have the same anti-inflammatory properties? They do. Um, and so let's just talk about that real quick because it's an important point. So what, we're, what you're really looking for, you know, we like I said earlier, we have to have inflammation to survive, right? And in fact, we have an evolutionary preference for inflammation because we were, if we weren't able to heal wounds or fight infections, you know, we couldn't, we didn't last very long. And so it's felt that the optimum dietary ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 is somewhere in the less than five to one. So let's just say three to one, omega-6 to omega-3. Um, the problem is in the Western diet, you know, if you're going to McDonald's a couple of days a week, you might be see omega-6, omega-3 ratios 50 to one. And even people that are on more of a, a, a vegan or less healthy plant-based vegan diet who are using a lot of edible oils, you can still see levels, you know, 10, 20 to one. So, so the key here is to really get that ratio down. And so there's two ways you can do that. One is you have to decrease 
your consumption of omega-6 fatty acids, and that's primarily meat and dairy. Although again, like I said, edible oils um, do have a fair amount of omega uh, of omega sixes. For example, olive oil is about thirteen to two, which is you know higher than that kind of three to one that you want. The other way you can you can do that is is increase. The other thing you need to focus on is increasing your omega three um, um, intake. And as I mentioned earlier, there's there is omega three in a lot of plants, typically seed nuts and seeds and chia seed, hemp seed, flax seed, etc. Um, now, people talk about fish oil which does in fact have omega-3s. But let me ask you this, Chuck, where do the omega-3s in these fatty fishes come from, right? Well, if you follow the food chain, right, they come from marine phytoplankton and algae, which is plants. So it's the same, chemically, it's the same thing. So using, when, when, when I have patients who have a chronic inflammatory condition or they're really struggling to get that omega-6, omega-3 ratio down and we want to kind of jumpstart that, I will sometimes recommend um, plant-based or algae-based omega-3 supplements. I, I actually take those to help me recover from, from my physical activity, my exercise uh, regimen. Um, the other problem with fish oil, by the way, there's two other problems with fish oil. One is a lot, many of them are highly contaminated with mercury and, and things because um, you know, the, 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 the fat in the fish bioaccumulates um, a lot of the toxins. You know, we talk, you hear about all the plastics in the ocean and all that. And so all those, uh, those forever chemicals start to start to bioaccumulate in the, in the fat. So that's not good. Um, and also, um, you know, there's, there's a huge concern about, about overfishing and, the, and that fisheries could collapse by 2050, which can have profound effects worldwide on, 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 you know, well, on, on people, on cultures who, who are, are communities who rely on, on fish for their livelihood or, or for, for, for some of their calories. So um, another reason to avoid fish oil is, is that, 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 that the overfishing is a real concern environmentally. And Karen, let's talk about oil from a culinary perspective now. Some of the upcoming episodes of The Doc and Chef very much feature what you would describe as a dry saute where you are cooking without oil. If somebody's looking at cutting that out of the diet, how difficult is that process? Do you really have to be kind of a culinary whiz to pull off this dry saute? No, sir, you do not. But there is a little bit of a, of a learning curve. So you wanna heat your pan up to a high, high heat and then throw your vegetables on. Usually it's a, it's um, onions, carrots, celery, whatever, those kinds of things that you start with and get, and get everything moving in the pan. Now just keep a little bit of water or vegetable broth off to the side. And as you start to see a little bit of browning on the bottom of the pan, so you want that because that's called fond, F-O-N-D. And they're just little bits of caramelized yumminess. So you wanna take that, that vegetable broth or that water you have off to the side, just put a tablespoon or so in, just drizzle it in, get that spatula, get underneath the fond and pull it up and put it back into the food. And that creates so much flavor. Now re remember that plants have, all plants have a lot of water in them. So once you do throw those, that, those vegetables into the pan to start, they will start to glisten because the water is coming out. You just want to make sure that you keep stirring, keep stirring, keep stirring. Do not, do not walk away from the pan and check your Instagram, feed the dog, yell at the kids, do the laundry. Don't do that. This is a practice, an exercise in mindful cooking. You just really want to stay on top of that food. Get it glistening, get it, get it cooked down, and then add the rest of your ingredients and you'll have a great meal without any oil. And remember also that oil per tablespoon, it doesn't matter what kind of oil it is. It can be olive oil, sesame oil, coconut oil, any kind of oil is about 126 calories per tablespoon. So when you are coating your pan, getting ready for that saute, you just add it in, probably do the math, 400, 600, maybe 800 calories, and you haven't even added any ingredients yet. So if you can pull the oil out, if you do nothing else, just pull the oil out of sauteing, of roasting, of your salad dressings, of your packaged goods, you'll start to see a slimmer you very, very soon, actually.
100%. And listen, if you guys want to see how to do this in practice, the very first episode of The Doc and Chef that was just released a couple of days ago goes into this in depth. You can really see these guys tag team it in the kitchen as only they can, showing you everything from the dry saute to deglazing a pan. You're going to see like that bond kind of thing that she's talking about like in practice. Like it's really cool. It gives you kind of the play by play, a really easy breakdown of how to introduce dry sauteing into your own kitchen. Um, um, Dr. Loomis got a transition here. We got a few minutes left. I want to bounce around and get to as many of the exam roomies questions as we can question from Carrie. And I'm sure that a few others are wondering about this as well. Carrie is wondering, uh, whether whole grain wheat can cause inflammation. So, you know, there are some people that are concerned about, uh, gluten, uh, particularly with, with causing inflammation. Now there are some people who have a clear gluten allergy, and that's, that's a condition called celiac disease. It's um, diagnosed typically through, through some blood tests. Um, now, there are some people who may have gluten intolerance and which can cause inflammation, uh, some, some inflammation. But I'm of the firm opinion, and it's, I'm not the only one, that, that it's not the gluten. This is actually a gut microbiome problem. Right. So when you know, if you think of your body as a house, we, we've got it in each room in the house is an organ system. Right. So we have a brain room. We have a joint room. We have a skin room. We have a we have a, um, a respiratory room, um, a thyroid room. And imagine that you fill your house up with angry people and then a stranger wanders into the house. Well, depending on what room they come into or the nature of the stranger dictates kind of what happens. Right. So they come in the joint room, you've got, you've got osteoarthritis or, or rheumatoid arthritis. They come in the skin room, you've got, you've, got, you've got eczema or psoriasis. They come in the thyroid room, you've got Hashimoto's thyroiditis. They come in the restroom, you've got asthma or allergies. So where are these angry people coming from? Well, we already talked about it, right? So it's, it's, it's eating a highly inflammatory diet, uh, omega, high omega-6, omega-3 ratio, and not enough antioxidants in our diet. But where are the angry people coming from? Well, um, we can breathe them in, and for example, with, with, you know, asthma and allergies, but most of them are probably coming in through our gut. So, you know, I used to think of our gut as something that was inside us. And, you know, um, and if you went to the operating room and you opened some of those, your guts, but if you think about it, our gut is actually outside us, the functional part, because our gut's a hollow tube that starts at point A, goes to point B, and his job is to take whatever we ingest in point A, let in the good stuff, keep out the bad stuff, and we're going to have point B. I used to think the bacteria that lived in the gut were along for the ride. If you went to Mexico and took some different, got some different bacteria, you had to take some Pepto-Bismol. But it turns out the bacteria that live in our gut play a fundamentally important role in maintaining the integrity of the gut. So in the small intestine where the kind of the nutritional transactions take place, between the cells, there's a tight junction that kind of keeps the, the bad stuff that we swallow, the bacteria, the viruses, the gluten antigens, milk proteins, things like that, which are really not designed to absorb into our bloodstream. And when we populate our gut with bacteria that aren't supposed to be there, that gut starts to leak. So we leak things like gluten, which comes from, is found in, in grains like wheat, into our bloodstream. And that is the stranger that, that triggers this kind of inflammatory, can be one of the strangers that uh, triggers this inflammatory process. So one of the beautiful things about a whole food plant-based diet is not only because it's got such a low omega-6 to 3 fatty acid ratio, because it's got a very high, uh, you've, got, you've got a high intake of these dietary antioxidants, now all of a sudden you've kicked all the angry people out of the house. And over time, because of the, the, the high fiber, the prebiotics that are present in these foods, particularly the beans that we talked about earlier, um, we can reset or regrow a healthy gut microbiome. So that shuts the front door. So um, oftentimes when people come in and they do seem to have some intolerance to things like grains or wheat, oftentimes within a weeks to, to a couple months of adapting a whole food plant-based diet, that, that inflammatory response goes away because, because of what I just said, you know, you've cut your, you've, you've gotten rid of the um, angry people and shut the front door to your house. Shut the front door, Dr. Loomis. Uh, really quick, rapid fire here. Uh, Kayla, 1034. What about using sprays like butter or olive oil spray to cook? So just a little dab on the pan. What would you say to that as opposed to pouring a little something, something out of a bottle? So if you look uh, at the, the back of the, the can and it says zero calories, zero fats, zero, 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 but it also says serving size, 
one eighth of a second. I, 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 I don't even think I could do, you know, and that of course doesn't cover a pan. So no, we're going shh. Now if, for argument's sake, yes. If you're even coating your pan with this aerosol can, then if you probably are getting less, but I mean, you're going to buy four cans a week, you know, I mean, come on. <laughs> when did when did when did time become a serving size? Right? I mean, I like, how much for this? An eighth of a second? What the heck does that even mean, man? And secondly, like, but, I don't know about you, but even on my phone, it's like it's like how how does one time out? Can you set an alarm for an eighth of a second? Like, it's up before you even hit start. Like, come on, like that's just right. crazy. Right. I, I think like, I think what they did was is they figured out how little you could spray. So that the, the 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 USDA said that there's no calories in it. So they worked mm -hmm. it backwards, right? So how can we call this zero? How can we call an oil-based product zero calories? Well, they, they're, they're, you know we'll, we'll get below the minimum serving that 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 triggers the labeling, right? And it turns out it's like an eighth of a second. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's wild, man. That I'm telling you, man. Oh, that's just so wild. All right. Uh, we got a lot of fermentation fans in the house today. 1029. Don't worry. Be happy. Awesome name. Uh, hi, Chuck and exam. Rumi's question for the doc are fermented foods such as sauerkraut and kimchi anti-inflammatory as well. So, so, the, so we talked about the role that gut bacteria play in triggering inflammation or, or having a, a, a what we call dysbiosis, having a disrupted gut microbiome. And by the way, you know, if we could design an environment in the modern world to destroy the human gut microbiome, we've done it, right? So babies <laughs> are born with, with little to no bacteria. You have a vaginal delivery, you breastfeed, you're getting, you know, bacteria from your mother. The rest of our lives, these healthy bacteria typically come from the dirt. So we less of our lives, we got our food out of the dirt, we play in the dirt, we got food that had bacteria on, you know, that had dirt on it, we drink water that had bacteria on it. Fast forward to the modern world, C-section babies, we don't breastfeed anymore. We put so many pesticides and herbicides on our food. We have to scrub the dirt off. We've, 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 you know, polluted the water. So we chlorinate it. We pass out antibiotics like the candy starting in an age, which can't tell the difference. And as, as opposed to the high fiber, low fat diet, which feeds healthy gut microbiome, we eat a high fat, low fiber diet, which, which destroys the human gut microbiome. So fermented foods are a great way to help restore the gut microbiome. And, and I'm a big fan. Um, now, you know, things like sauerkraut and pickles, you want to be sure you're not getting the ones off the shelf that have been pasteurized, which the bacteria been, where have been killed or destroyed. What you're looking for is one that's in the refrigerated section that has live culture. It's very easy, actually, uh, fermenting your own, making your own pickles and sauerkraut isn't nearly as hard as kimchi, isn't as hard as you think it might be. Uh, there's a lot of great books out there. There's a book I recommend called Fermenting Vegetables. Um, it's a husband wife couple. Uh, makes this very accessible. So I'm a big fan of fermented foods. Karen, do you whip some up at the shop? The fermented you know, foods? Ev um, every once in a while I do, I kind of go in waves. Um, but actually Jim does it at his house. And don't you have a, a crock, Jim? I do. do I, have a, I, I have a stoneware crock that I make. Yeah. I make kimchi and sauerkraut. My favorite though are tabletop pickles. Um, you know, I go to the farmer's market and I get some okra. I, and I don't really scrub them. I leave some of that bacteria on there. I make a, a, a brine out of, I use distilled water because the chlorine will kill the bacteria. And then I put all kinds of herbs. I put spices. I put finagig seeds and mustard seeds and peppercorns mm. and dill and, and, and um. onion and garlic and, um, um, and, and some chili peppers. And uh, put a little cap on it. Put, I mean, put, put a little cheesecloth on it. Put it on the tablecloth. And in, in about two or three days, it starts to bubble. And it's fermenting, and then I I'll, after a couple of days I taste it, and when it gets that kind of sourness, I'll cap it and put it in the refrigerator. Rarely lasts more than a day or two. And I've done I've done you know pickles, you know cucumbers, okra, beets, carrots. Um, one of my favorite things to do is broccoli stems. Um, broccoli stems are oh, high yeah. in porous, and they really soak up all of that wonderful flavor. So yeah, it's it's one of my I love. This is you know we're getting into farmer's market season. So I'll get my fermenting game back, back up and running here pretty soon. Oh man. Uh, pleased to be bringing some this weekend when we're all at the Fairfax veg fest <laughs> together, just outside of uh, Washington, right. DC. Um, yeah, right. yeah. The doc and chef live in the DC area. So this is actually one of the better uh, veg fests in the entire country. It's put on by Gwen Whitaker, the founder of green fair organic cafe and restaurant. 
just about a stone's throw from Dallas Airport. And so uh, Sunday, April 23rd, we're all going to be out there. I'm emceeing that day. The Doc and Chef are going to be live and in person. Do you guys know what you're cooking up yet? We have an idea. Okay. There it is. Look, Do you want to know? Uh, I mean. Well, I, I didn't know if you wanted to keep it a surprise or not. But, well, okay, so we're going to be, uh, let me just tell you, we're going to tackle the, the three topics that we're going to tackle. First, we're going to do protein, of course, and then we're going to slide into fiber and then end with soy. There it is. Those are the three biggies right there. When it comes to plant-based nutrition, yeah. those are the three biggies. Y'all are hitting on the Holy Trinity. And you see Ollie coming through again, fairfaxvegfest.org. Let me, Ollie is just on the ball today. I know. Yeah. Clap it up for Ollie in the chat, please. Thank you. Uh, anyway, so uh, check out fairfaxvegfest.org. <laughs> Appreciate you, Karen. Uh, FairfaxVegFest.org for a full speaker lineup and uh, all the details. Dr. Barnard will also be there that day, along with uh, Dr. T. Colin Campbell, myself, Robert Cheek, Vegan Strongman. He's going to be there. Matter of fact, the entire uh, Vegan Strongman team, the Vegan Gym, they're going to be out there. I mean, just incredible feats of strength. I saw these guys out in Los Angeles a few weeks ago who had managed to get a line of people down the street waiting to do pull-ups. It was like a test. <laughs> And I have never in my entire life seen people so excited to exercise, <laughs> but man, like they're, this, I'm dead serious. Like they are surrounded by nothing but like fried food. It's all vegan, but like nothing but junk food essentially. And then here are these like really fit guys and they're convincing everybody to come and do pull-ups. And I'm like, these guys have broken through. They have somehow cracked the code that healthy is cool. And I was I was just really impressed. So I'm curious to see how long the line's going to be this weekend as well. So anyway, FairfaxVegFest.org. And of course, look, the Doc and Chef. I do not have a lot of time in my life, but the time that I do have, I devote to projects I believe in. So I am thrilled to be a producer for this project because what Dr. Loomis and Karen are able to do together is write the prescription for health, and then Karen fills it in the kitchen, and it's all done in 10 to 20 minutes, and it's just these fun, exciting, educational, enlightening episodes that quite literally can plant the seeds for you to change your own life and improve your own health. So the premiere episode is out now. There's a link to the Doc and Chef YouTube channel right now in the show description. Go ahead, watch that, like the video, subscribe to their channel, because guys, I'm telling you, I'm not overselling this when I say this is the next big thing when it comes to the plant-based community. So Doc, Chef, it's been a real pleasure being able to share some time with you today. And thank you guys so very much for your time and raising our health IQs with us here on The Exam Room Live. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, boss. Yeah. <laughs> She's going to kill the rest of the chocolate smoothie now. I guarantee you that. I guarantee you that. So if we did not get to your question today, have no fear. Plenty more still to discuss when it comes to inflammation. We're going to tackle that on an upcoming episode. Also, don't forget, in addition to the Fairfax Veg Fest, uh, in just a couple of weeks, I'm going to be up at the Toronto Planted Expo up there at the Entercare Center. That's going to be April 29th and 30th. I'll be speaking on the 30th uh, right after our good friend Carly Bodrug from Plant U. Dr. Michael Greger will also be there. John Badass Vegan Lewis. He was just on the show. He's going to be there as well. So check out plantedlife.com for ticket information there. Full speaker lineup. And then of course the exam room live. We are going to be in New York for a major, major, major show on July 12th. Would love for you to come out and celebrate with us as we continue our 12 million download celebration. 100 million streams here on YouTube. And we're going to do it up big time style at the Museum of the City of New New York on July 12th. So pcrm.org slash events to secure your ticket today. We sold out LA, so I do not expect New York to be any different. So lock in your space today, pcrm.org slash events. But for today, this episode, that is all the time that we have. I want to say thank you one more time to the doc, Dr. Jim Loomis and the chef. STL Veg Girl, Karen Dugan, for being here and helping to raise our health IQs. And of course, to the crew behind the scenes for making the magic happen. You guys rock. And to you, exam roomies, thanks for raising your health IQ with us, doing it a little bit early this week, but nonetheless, very educational, enlightening. All of our health IQs are up. And on behalf of everybody here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again very soon. But until then, keep it plant based. <laughs>